Today's show is so important. I don't know if you've thought about this, but America is at a place right now where this is really our last stand for America. I cannot emphasize this enough. Uh, Lou Engel made the statement recently, this is our last stand for America, and he's, he's going to be mobilizing a big prayer movement on Yom Kippur in 2024, right before the November election, hoping that one million women and one million Mordecais, one million Esthers are going to be on the mall. But preceding that, we're going to be seeing a year of incredible spiritual conflict because the devil knows that he doesn't have this wrapped up. We still have hope. And that's what this broadcast is going to be about. I want you to watch it with a Jenny Donnelly. It's actually an interview I did for her podcast, and it's so um, so much better, I think, than what, what I could have done if it had been reversed, that I want you to watch it right now. I want you to get the message, catch the anointing that is on the subject of fighting for your family, what's at stake, where does the church upgrading its revelation, and how can you find your place and position in the greatest move of God America's ever seen. Welcome to the Lance Wallnow Show today. Thank you so much for being on here today. This is super special. And Lance, I just first and foremost want to thank you for all those whiteboards. I don't know how many whiteboards <laughs> you've written on, but it really affected us in business. It created profound change and it was scalable and duplicatable. A lot of our business leaders took it and ran with it. And who knows wow. how many people are teaching the stuff you're teaching. So it's just an honor to have you on here today. I am so excited for people to hear um, what you're holding in your heart, in your spirit, in your soul for this next year. I think we could all agree we're sitting in one of the most important years of the history of our nation. And like I said from the very beginning, we've got a problem with the destruction of the family, yeah. the attack on our children. So let's um, let's do this. Let's dive into the seven mountains. And you can take this anywhere you want. I mean, you can steer this show wherever you think it needs to go, honestly. Um, but for the seven mountains, can you tell us what it is, why the church, especially people, you know, not the church building, but people like you and me, we are the church. Why should the church body know about the seven mountains? And let's just start there. Well, the Seven Mountains actually came from Kim Clement telling me, who's a great prophet. You know, a lot of people know he's almost like Nostradamus. I predicted that. I said, after you're gone, they're going to treat you like Nostradamus. They're going to go back on everything you ever said and cryptically torture it in or out of context to derive some kind of meaning. It's like, you know, if you watch the Foundation series on Apple, it's great. It's Isaac Asimov's science fiction about Harry Seldon, who's this futurist mathematician, uh, historian, who predicts the future. And after he's dead, uh, every hundred years, a Seldon prophecy materializes in a crystal. And, the, and everybody can't wait to hear what Harry Seldon says. I said, Kim, that's going to end up being you. And, and it is him. And who knows? He got me involved with Seven Mountains. So here's what happened. He prophesies over a senator named Michael Kratz. He says, you're going to be involved in politics, Michael. You're going to have a son named Caleb, and your son's going to walk in the same steps as his father. Michael is a businessman in like Conyers, Georgia or something. He runs for office, drops dead of a heart attack 15 minutes after he leaves the Marriott Hotel, you know, right getting his campaign started. They couldn't resuscitate him, so they take him down to like the hospital, Bellevue, whatever hospital. His wife, Phyllis, comes in. For another 10 minutes, they're trying to get a heartbeat, so it's 30 minutes. They no heartbeat, no breath. They go to her and say, "Ma'am, we're sorry, we couldn't get him. Uh, we couldn't pull him out." And but he's an organ donor, according to his driver's license, and we we just need your authorization. And she just she's a young Christian, and she just got this prophetic word. So she goes in to where this body is and starts prophesying over him. Michael, the word of the Lord says that you're going to be in politics, and you're going to have a son named Caleb. Who at that point was two. And uh, you're, he's going to walk in the same steps. You haven't done that yet. So she, as a young Christian, is prophesying over a dead husband, a, an unfulfilled prophecy. So the uh, wow. the surgeons call for um, security because they got a delirious Pentecostal manifesting there, <laughs> and she won't leave, obviously. So they say, hey, get the surgery in here. Get, get the security in. Security comes in, and they pull her off his body, at which point she commands, Michael, Come back into your body now. And he goes back into his body. He gets elected for four terms as a state senator in Georgia. Wow. He presided over very important cases. 
and he told me what happened during the 30 minutes out of his body. Okay. And this is where the Seven Mountains comes from. Wow. So I got this revelation from a dead senator that went to heaven. How's that for an origin? <laughs> That's incredible. I love that. And uh, he says to me, Lance, he says, so there I was, and, and I wanted to go. I didn't want to go back. And I wanted Phyllis and Caleb to come be with me. I thought that's kind of always ironic. You always wonder what your dead loved ones departed. You, you grieve over them because you're on earth. I want you to know the first thing that they really ask for if they love you is they want you to die quickly so you could be with them. So it's a really weird scenario. He's praying for his wife and child to die, basically, so they could be with him. And Jesus says, I want to show you something. He shows him this body of water, which is clear like a plasma screen TV. And suddenly these islands appear. And as Michael and I discuss it, there are these seven islands that, that begin to come up out of the water. And, and one of them is a mountain of government. And the Lord points to it and says, that's the government domain. And you are called to go there, but there must be agreement. And then Michael is called by his wife back into his body. Wow. And he proceeds to run. So what Michael told me was he saw a vision of all these islands of occupation. He said, but what's mm. weird is Jesus is occupied till I come. But what I saw wasn't preachers. I saw people literally with occupations. Come he on, said hey. they were like ordinary people. They were the housewife, the daycare worker, the dentist. The, and they were rising up. And when they rose up, they were exercising authority over the sphere that God gave them. Man. And hell could not take it. And wow. I said, wow. So he and I noodled on this one mountain out of seven, which I knew was government. Then I met Lauren Cunningham, and he told me the rest of the story. He said, you know, I've been teaching for years about seven mind molders of culture. I said, really? I got this one I know about, which is government. He said, well, it's church, family, education, government, media, arts, and business. He said, the Lord spoke to me that we're called to make disciples of nations. And if only the people of God would rise up in their occupation, they work 90% of the time there anyway, sanctified into a missionary call and expand the kingdom in the domain that God assigns you because we could change nations, disciple them. If we literally went into the mind molding power of culture in those seven vertical domains, I thought, wow. So I, I got that revelation of seven mountains. I filled them in. He said, but what's interesting is, Lance, he said, I know that it's a revelation from God that God gave me because I met Bill Bright once, and he's uh, with Campus Crusade. And Bill Bright and I met, and he produced a, 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 a napkin out of his pocket where he just got a revelation of seven world kingdoms. And the Lord told him that if we could wow. only penetrate these seven world kingdoms, all the kingdoms of this world would have the witness of the gospel of the right. kingdom. And Come he on. said, and I said, what are the seven? Because I got seven. I didn't want to tell him what they were. He <laughs> said, they're religion, academia. Um, uh, ac there was a religion, family, academia, politics, news, entertainment, and finance. They literally were different words for everything except for the family mountain. They both got the same language. Hmm. Wow. So I heard that and I thought, to be honest with you, I thought, the, that revelation never got the visibility it should have got in our charismatic, Pentecostal, prophetic community. And, and the reason wow. being that we love the supernatural, but we, when it comes down to something like this, yeah. this makes it a little almost too practical for the average mystic. And, and so when I started teaching it, it went viral. I mean, to the point where today people argue with me over who originated this. And it's like, I could care less who originated it, right. just so long as they get the same message. As long as they say what I'm saying, I don't right. care if they take credit for it. But it was so viral, people thought they were hearing it themselves for the first time from heaven. Once wow. they heard it, it was like, I got a revelation. And I get that. If it's a revelation, yep. you feel like almost yep. like God gave you the message. Totally. Cool, <laughs> run with it. But what, what disappointed me was, now we're in a moment in American history where we see the weakness of a church that does not occupy culture. We see what the price is you pay for having a, uh, a, a, let's say, what's the word? A gospel of salvation focus, which is church-centric spirituality for me personally, and I'm going to heaven when I die. And so all of our focus is on church and evangelism and personal overcoming, as opposed to the gospel mm -hmm. of the kingdom, which is to go make disciples of nations starting in the sphere that you're in 
and learning how to expand dominion within that sphere to your salt and light. And in my teaching, to you ascend up the hierarchy to a point of maximum impact where you're taking on the gates of hell that are trying to manipulate that sphere of education or take down the family or take over your government. Meet the enemy at the gates. And Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell will not prevail. Where are those gates located? I just gave you the seven, the seven addresses. That's the seven zip codes of where hell has its, has its, its um, stronghold, but the church only mm-hmm. occupies one or two of them, me and my family and my church. Right. Therefore, we're mm-hmm. now surrounded by, uh, you know, dare I say, you know, the, the militant paganism is now surrounding us because they've taken over those institutions. And now we're kind of waking up and still arguing, I might add. Mm-hmm. Should the church right. be involved with politics? Should the church be involved? It's like, all right, well, is the church involved with Christian television? You know, we fought that in the 1960s. Pat Robertson had to fight it. Paul Crouch did. Now every preacher that was against Christian television is dead and wishes they were on Christian television. So, you know, so we're a little slow to this thing, but I think we're getting there. Wow. Now, is it fair to say, I just want to make this really black and white for some people listening. Is it fair to say, I'm thinking about the Grammys, you know, when we had our satanic worship session presented to us across the airways. Is it yeah. fair to say, yeah, that if if people who call themselves Christians have permission and a charge, if this is their particular gift, their particular anointing, that they could make their way to those tables where that decision was made. Because I just envision a table of people saying, hey, how do we want to entertain America over the Grammys? Right. And they all decide on this whatever, you know. But if somebody is seated right there at that table Mm -hmm. who has light, right? Because light overwhelms the darkness. Darkness doesn't just give up. Is it practical enough for me to say that we need to get people into these decision tables, into these conversations that say, hey, wait a minute, I have a pretty cool idea. And the idea they have is so anointed. It's so incredibly powerful that people at that table say, well, yeah, let's do that instead. Um, You know, I, I, I was just seeing Paw Patrol is in 350 million households. That's a cartoon for ages three to five years old two to five years old. Uh, my kids know what it is. They know every single character. And they they now have a new writer for Paw Patrol. And the writer, she has a channel on YouTube called Queer Kid Stuff. Okay, she has a channel to help kids become queer, become drag queens. Um, you can look it up yourself, but she's now the writer for Paw Patrol. Um, to me, if we don't send people with light in them to these places, and uh, celebrate that. Like, no, we don't want just want you with a microphone inside the church. We right. want you in spheres of culture where you can be the writer of Paw Patrol. You can be the writer of Disney and whatever. So is, is this what you're talking about? Is this an example? You got a hundred percent. And like, I'll give you a good personal example. I, I led a guy to the Lord back uh, in Rhode Island when, once, once upon a time when I was pastoring. And um, he got hired by Disney. And he drew me a picture, a cartoon of an angel. And he said, you don't know how valuable this is because beginning tomorrow, I cannot draw anything for anyone other than Disney. I'm under contract. This pen belongs to Disney. He contacted me later and said that as a young Christian hired by Disney, I'll never know the number of times that he uh, used his influence to Um, subtly divert the occult from getting into Disney work because he as a Christian could discern good from evil. And it wasn't LGBT stuff back then. It would be, it would be, you know, the Harry Potter era and how he kept them from, from connecting spiritism, mysticism, sorcery, and witchcraft into the stories by another mechanism that he came up with as a writer and as an illustrator. There we go. And so, and I real, so to your point, uh, Psalm 110 says, you know, that we're, we will sit with our enemies at the gate. There's Come your on. promise for what you just said. We're wow. not supposed to, we're not always going to take over the gate at the New York Times, but at least we can have one intelligent Christian conservative who is bold enough to say, this is what I believe. And by the way, that's rubbish. I'm going to write an article and I, on the opinion side 
and represent uh, a different perspective. But, and, and you know, I'm not saying it's always a career. It requires great courage to do what I'm talking about because Jerry Boykin was fired from the military because he dared to speak in a Sunday school during the Iraq era, that it was a spiritual warfare that was going on in the world. Well, right away, liberals grabbed that and said, he's equating Islam with a spiritual evil and Christianity with a virtue. It was a Sunday school. His speech in a church should have been allowed to have happened, but it was taken by Bush. He fired him from the Pentagon, a great general. Now he works for Family Research Council. And I call that career martyrdom. Sometimes you take a stand and it costs you something. But a lot of times you take a stand and uh, they respect you for it. And you become the sole voice that everybody knows is the conservative. The but they respect you because your competency and your results speak for themselves. And, and I'm saying that the, the model you're talking about requires a church change. So I just got done preaching to 100 countries, 100 nations in Jerusalem. I flew in 48 hours ago. Spent a week there from Yom Kippur back to Rosh Hashanah. We do a feast days, and I, I kind of fill in for a big conference there every year. And I told the leaders of those churches, I said, do not make the mistake the United States made. We're playing catch up with a weak church that is trying to uh, discover a little late that they should have been guarding the gates. Mm -hmm. Now the gates are occupied, and it's five times harder to take a gate once you had it and gave it up. The enemy takes it. Harvard's harder to get into now than when it started. So... um, And it started as a Christian school. Now try to get there with a Christian message. They'll kick you off the campus. So, but I told him this. I said, change your model of church. You're really called to be an apostolic church. You're living in an apostolic age of missionary work. You're not called to be a little local church servicing the needs of a couple of people. You're called to be raising up influencers that are going to disciple your nation. And the gates of hell are located in academia, in the courts, in journalism, in law, in entertainment, in sports. They're in finance and in business. They're in your communities and they're in your own families. I want you to begin to train your people that instead of coming to us where we have a secret society, we're going to go to you and help fortify you to take more territory. Advance the church, put the church in the middle of a hub, and then put the spokes out here to the seven mountains and help your people take their mountain. Come on, Mm -hmm. that's so good. Okay, I think you need to ask him about that conversation Mm -hmm. you had with the guy on the airplane. Oh, okay, for sure. We'll see if we can get get that done before this episode's over. Okay, okay. So Lance, I was, my sister and I actually, we were on our way to St. Louis for the first Freedom Tour spot. And we're next, my sister and I are on the plane sitting next to this man and he was, an older guy and we're teasing him about his Skittles. He had this giant bag of Skittles and we were teasing him that we were going to take some when he fell asleep. And, and he said he had two daughters about our ages and it was just a great conversation, a great time. We're connecting with them. And all of a sudden things shifted radically because he asked us where we were going and what we were doing. And when we told him about don't mess with our kids, when we told him about Washington DC and the million women and their families, he it was, it was wild what happened. And he said, why in the world would you waste so much time, so much energy, so much money for that? You guys have been watching way too much Fox news. I you're, this is totally crazy. This makes no sense. This isn't even a thing. And I thought, whoa. And we had a, we were able to find some places where there was agreement He actually ended up apologizing to us, but I think that there's not just people like him. I don't think he was a believer. I think there are believers that actually feel a similar way. It's something that maybe they're not saying out loud, but they're sort of wondering, like, is this really a thing? Is this really something that we should stand for? Is this really something that we should risk for? So what would you say about that? Jesus is just going to come back. Yeah, that too. And the world is going to hell in a handbasket anyway. So Mm -hmm. what can I do about it? Why reformation? Why not just revival? Right, and there, and why, so there's two questions right there. One is, how do you how do you explain this to the brainwashed, brain numbed, cultural byproduct of CNN and secular news propaganda? Right. So he's saying you've been listening to Fox. The reality is, he's been listening to every channel but Fox, 
And he doesn't listen to Tucker, so he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't listen to Mark Levin, which also means we're talking to ourselves. And so let's let's be aware of that. Yeah. So so the real the real art here is you take a story about like this girl, this young lady. Have you met Aaron yet from Colorado? Mm-hmm. Yes. All right. Yes. You guys are gonna be running him. buddies very soon. Mm-hmm. So I'm meeting with some legislators in Colorado, and I don't wanna I don't wanna blow all my clandestine activity on a public broadcast, but by the time this is out, it'll be news. Anyway, so I'm working with some legislators there because I think Colorado needs a wake-up call. Come on. Their their schools, there are 1,000 schools in the United States. This is a fact. You could have told this man. And we got to get our facts and our stories ready for these people. That's how the left does it. They're great storytellers, and they're good fact quoters, even if their facts aren't fact-checked. Here's the, here's what you tell them. Are you aware of the fact that there's over 1,000 schools in the United States that are aggressively right now trying to target your girls so that they'll become boys and that they'll make those decisions between 11, 12, or 13 years of age and that they're not obligated to tell you as a father that your daughter is transitioning? And by the way, you see those Skittles right there? There's a program called Skittle, which is actually wow. done as a substitute program for an art class where they literally go in to talk to your little precious little 12 year old and plant the thought that they're not really sure who their body is and if they're aligned with it, they're bringing up questions little girls should have to worry about and they're making them doubt if they're really a girl and they're telling them, shh, but don't talk to your parents, it might not be safe. Then they're gonna begin to identify after they get their flags and their rings and their bands as the LGBTQ and you think it's really cool because you're such a progressive American. And what you don't realize is your daughter is right now being groomed for a procedure where she's going to medically want to be able to have her body altered, have a mastectomy or to start taking puberty block blockers as she gets older. She's going to begin to take testosterone. She'll never be able to have children. And if you want to have an adult conversation, she'll never have a sexual climax. They will alter her physiology so she'll never know the joy of sex. And all this is happening because you think we're delusional. There's 1,000 schools where that's the policy. They're planning on taking this through the nation. And you don't know about it? Why do you think we're going to Washington to wake up men like you? Yep. That's why we're doing this podcast, because we're bringing awareness. I didn't even know Mm -hmm. some of what you just said, so thank you, Lance. Hey, let's take a moment right here and talk about something. You know, these programs are actually paid for by sponsors. And so the one thing that I always do is try to pick the sponsors that have the greatest value. Those are the ones that I myself believe in. Now, the Birch Gold Group is one of those key sponsors, and I'll tell you why. The economy is the area that I'm the most concerned about in terms of instability in the future. Do you know that right now, China and Russia and India is meeting with Saudi Arabians and South Africans to create an alternative economy, to basically crush the dollar. This is gonna have a massive effect on the stock market, on real estate. It'll be a real shaking, but you don't have to be shaken because there's a way you can protect your retirement, your 401ks, your IRAs, by connecting them in with gold. Gold is unique in history in that it's a place of stored value. In fact, those BRICS nations of Brazil and Russia, India and China, they're going to be backing themselves with, guess what? Gold. So be smart. I want you to go to lancewallet.com forward slash birch and get a free information kit. Get knowledge, act quickly, don't wait. And they're going to be able to help you make a great decision on what to do. Remember, that information is free with no strings attached. Do it now. LanceWallow.com forward slash Birch. Lance, we started talking about revival and reformation. I know the word revival, you know, it's it's caught fire. I have t-shirts with revival. I love revival. Revival has to happen. What is this reformation side that we need to get a hold of? (laughs) You know, it's funny what you're saying. The Lord told me a while ago, he said, revival is Rachel. Jacob loved Rachel. She was voluptuous. She was beautiful. She was his first love. Leah is reformation. She's the less attractive sister that produces the government, the priesthood, and the ultimate dominion of Christ. In other words, Leah was the one who birthed like Judah out of which the Messiah came. Rachel was beautiful, but, uh, you know, and thank God for Joseph and for Benjamin, but the priesthood and Levi and government and Simeon and Reuben, seeing the kingdom, hearing the kingdom, being a priesthood and governing all came from the unwanted wife. 
So wow. the church wants to see the kingdom come. They want to hear God's voice. They, and this is what Simeon means, what Reuben means. They want to be, we want to see a royal priesthood, the priests of Levi and Judah dominating in the culture, but they're not willing to leave the sanctuary to go to the unattractive battle zone. They want wow. to sit there and have God come visit them with glory and gold dust and miracles and be slain in the spirit thinking that the multitudes will come out to their Azusa Street and America shall be saved. Let me tell you, the number one problem we have with this revival focus, I have to say, is my company of preachers. Because if you think about it, where does revival take you? It takes you right to the preachers and the teachers and the revivalists. Revival and revivalists go together. So all the ministries that have ministries, they're all preaching revival, what God wants to say. It brings all the attention back to what they're doing. Wow. The reason why we're in the mess we're in is we never equip the church to go out and do what they're called to do. They're not right. called to be in the church. I'm a Levite. My, I'm an Ashkenazi Jew in my father's bloodline. We're the Levites. So I, I actually have a call. I'm a teacher in the Bible by bloodline. I could understand why God would make me a rabbi. The Levites didn't get to go occupied territory. They didn't rule on the throne. They didn't make Solomon's fortune. That's the beauty of the body of Christ. 90% of the church is called to go out and unpack the power of God in some sphere outside of the sanctuary. Wow. But we put them all back in the sanctuary to seek God for a revival. Mm -hmm. Reformation is where we need the church to go in education because they're coming after your children. Uh, we need reformation in, 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 in government because they're coming after your children. And when you have media and you have government and you have big business all conspiring to come after your children, yeah. you don't want to be in the sanctuary saying, you know, I've got my antidote and it's going to be my revival. You actually have to unpack your revival out there. Now that's called reformation. Wow. Okay. So I'm just, I'm just thinking about the person who goes, okay, I hear, I hear you, Lance. I understand where reformation is, but why, why would we go after reformation when Jesus is coming back any minute here? And you know, why, why don't mess with our kids? Why put time and effort into this when things are just going to get worse and worse? We know the end of the story, Jesus is coming back. So. Well, that's, that's a legitimate question. And that okay. is, and, and it's something which, you know, I, I, anyone who's rational has to think about. Why would I um, be um, trying to save my money and get out of debt when I know America is going to head to a Great Depression? Because you're going to mitigate the pain of the Great Depression if you prepare yourself for it. Mm -hmm. So if you want government to continue to allow you the freedom to be able to meet as a Christian family and not muzzle your children so that they can't speak Jesus' name, then you must meet the enemy at the gates and draw a line thus far and no further because there's going to be different places affected differently by the coming tribulation and distress. Nobody knows the day or the hour when Jesus comes back. Okay. The last thing you want to do is find out he's coming back in 20 years and you disconnected from your assignment, from your obedience, okay. and from your influence 19 years before he was coming back and right. didn't bring him the fruit of what he gave you to accomplish. You know who that is? That's the wicked and slothful servant That's who it. took the gift that God gave them of influence, there of money, go. of evangelism, of creativity, of entrepreneurial excellence, and instead of putting it to work to give him something when he comes back, they buried it thinking it's no use anyway, proving the primary spirit behind those Christians who use the rapture and the end times as a cover for disengagement is laziness. Wow. Wow. That's intense. Oof. I think that's right. And fear. I think it's fear. Yeah, la well. lazy, it's laziness and fear. And, yeah. and they hide their cowardice behind a theological veil. Well, the Lord's coming back anyway. The worst state in the United States and the one that has the greatest potential is California. California, as they say, because California goes, so goes the nation. We better pray that isn't the case because right now they're passing legislation that allows 18-year-old males to have sex with 13 or 14-year-old boys, and they're making it a law. They're, they're, they're struggling right now. Newsom had to draw a line because he's looking at the White House and saying, ah, you know what? I'd like to take the parents' children away from them if they don't affirm transgender. If their kid wants to convert to another gender, I'd like to pull them away so the state takes them. 
But I don't think America's ready for that yet. I got to draw the line there. So he goes right up to the line, tests the weather. But these guys don't have a conscience on where they're going to take your family in the future. What I'm saying is California has more Christians there, uh, has enough Christians in order to flip California so that they reform it. The number wow. one problem in California is only half the Christians are registered to vote. The other problem is only half of those that are registered show up to vote. And the major problem is it's places like um, where Chuck Smith was and the place where the revival happened in the Jesus movement, where they preach a gospel of the rapture and disengagement from culture. So you don't have, so Christians are basically thinking the rapture is going to happen soon. Maybe we'll accelerate when the Lord comes back by letting things deteriorate faster. That's wow. pure selfishness. And I can promise you the Lord isn't coming back for a selfish bride. No. Wow. And it feels like it's plain God because there's been times in history when things have gone on where you would think, well, surely Jesus is coming back right now, but we aren't to play God. We aren't to decide. We are every to era, occupy until every, he comes. Every era yeah. has said that. I mean, when I was in every the 19th, we were talking, I, I dropped out of college because uh, it was uh, uh, every, every theme that I had during the Jesus movement, the 1970s was, you know, um, the, the second coming of Christ, the rapture. Uh, soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. Maranatha Ministries, you know, was, everything had a focus on the second coming. So I said, what's the use? What's the value? I dropped out. And I wanted to go do soul winning, the only thing I thought was important. And uh, it took me till I was like 40 years old. The Lord hadn't come back yet. And I realized that for me to influence universities and colleges, I actually had to have a master's degree to write curriculum, even do wow. textbooks. So I had to go in my 40s and get a master's degree um, because I was premature listening to the end time teachers who said Jesus is coming back any day. Well, if he's coming back any day, you better, you better occupy right up to the moment he comes and be ambitious right. about giving him something to show him when he returns. Amen. Wow. And even, you know, when you look biblically for people who say, well, I don't know if Reformation is biblical. Well, when you read the Bible, that's what you're going to see. And, you know, we're kind of following Esther here. We feel like we're in an Esther moment in time. And you have to look at what happened with her. So she's a young gal. They say maybe 14 years old. Her parents have died. Mordecai adopts her, which is incredible. Um, but what happens is she does get chosen as the queen. That's pretty cool. She probably thought at that moment, whew, I've arrived. I'm safe in the palace, you know, just in time for Mordecai to ruin her comfort zone. And he comes in and says, hey, the decree has been passed. The Jews are going to be annihilated. But the only hope would be Esther. You're right there in the palace. You could talk to the king. Her first response back is I can't. I mean, essentially, that's the translation. It's illegal. It's against the law. Hey, I'd love to save my nation, yeah. but I can't. And I think we're in right now, we're in Esther 413. I don't think the church is in 414. Yeah. 414 is for such a time as this. You know, it's kind of Mordecai's like, we're going to do this. But in 413, Mordecai says to Esther, uh, Esther, you're already dead. Yeah. He basically says, I know you can't, but here's the problem with that answer. Don't think that just because you're in your palace. Right that you are safe from the destruction of the Jews. In other words, you're already dead, Esther. I used to think when she said, if I die, I die, that that was a noble, mm -hmm. you know, uh, de declaration, which there's some nobility to it. But I think she just logically said, wait a minute. So what you're saying is they're going to kill me even though I'm in the palace? Yep, yep, you'll go down too. And she says, okay, so I'm going to die for sure here. And if I go to the king, I might die. I mean, there's a good chance I'll die because it's illegal to do this. And she kind of looked at her two options and said, well, if I die, I die. Here's what wow. she did. She called for a fast. She called for prayer. She was hardcore too. She said, don't eat or drink. Okay. The girl wasn't on a Daniel fast. She just had everybody. It's, it's serious. But what she didn't do was just pray and fast for an angel to show up to the king. God, would you just make an angel show up? Or how about his mm. servant? His servant, that guy that always brings him wine every three seconds. Maybe that guy, maybe that guy can tell him what's really going on. She didn't wimp out. She didn't duck. She didn't dodge the command which from Mordecai, which was you go tell him. And so as we look at this, we've been saying, we're going to pray. 
we're going to fast, but we're going to stand. If we just pray and fast, then we've ha- we have our head in the sand. We have to stand. We're going to have to use our voices. And there's been such a spirit of fear over the church. It's becoming unnerving, to be honest. It, it's, it's bothering me, okay? <laughs> because I'm a mother. I have five children. I don't have grandkids yet, but I can easily see where this thing's headed. I asked my daughter, a Gen Z, she's 15. Her name's Esther. I said, Esther, do you think that moms and dads should fight do you think don't mess with our kids is a worthy fight right now? Do you see what's going on in America? And she said, mom, I think my age needs to fight. She goes at this rate, my kid will come home from school and want to be a goldfish. That's what she said to me. <laughs> and I thought, man, I said, I, I totally underestimated the fact that she was grabbing a hold of the urgency of the hour that America is in a crisis, but I have such hope in people moving into action, common people, you know, I don't need to look for some big name to do something big. And I I hope big names use their influence. I hope they stand before the Lord and say, you know what, I'm going to stand, I'm going to risk because here's the real question. Do any of us have a palace that will save us? I mean, where America's headed, if we just let this thing slip on down the mountain, do, does my ministry, does her voice ministry just save me from this thing? My kids does, being in homeschool. Right. The homeschool yeah, palace. I homeschool my kids, but that's not going to save mm-hmm. my family. And so there's this delusion that because I have X amount of followers on Instagram, or I have a, a ministry that's going really well, or I have a really great business, which are all godly assignments. I'm not, I'm not saying they're not godly, but the Lord had to come head to head with me and say, what if those things, Jenny, what if the success that you're having in your family right now, what if the success of your businesses, what if the success of your church, of your ministry, what if those successes hinge upon the next 12 months, America being back on her feet, back on her godly feet again. And so I just couldn't stand before God and give it excuses anymore. That's how I made it here. I'm just a common woman that loves Jesus and has kids and can see a little bit down the road and want to do something about it. And that's why we're calling people to this hour. What thoughts do you have about that, Lance? I mean, especially the palace concept. What do you think about that? I, I think it's profound. I've never thought that if I die, I die means, and I think you're right, that she realized that if she can't hide in the palace and have immunity because she'll be outed by somebody that she's a Jew, um, and all Jews, reluctantly to the king, he'll say, reluctantly, honey, you got to go. Uh, basically, she thought she might be able to escape the purge. And so she would die if she got rejected by him because he has to hold out a scepter when she goes to court uninvited, which means that you might not think the timing is right, but wow. uh, risking your life is, uh, is a matter of obedience, not convenience. So I think you're, you're spot on. And the idea that you're saying that, I don't, want to, I don't want the people listening to catch this, that Esther 4.13 is the date when you're talking about everyone coming out, but, uh, but that corresponds to April 13 too. So that April 13 is a date it was picked because it's connected to the, even the Esther scripture on, on 4.13. And I believe that all of what you're saying is absolutely right. And the part that I think is the most disconcerting is the uh, when you say that Reformation has to be sold to Christians, it seems kind of bizarre when you paint the picture that you're painting, that Christians have to be told they've got to go forth to where the battle is and show up. And I think you put your finger on it, and it is fear that a lot of them, we've been so soft. You know, what happens is you have a generation that's raised without warfare, and then it's afraid. Yep. This is God knew this. When he took the children of Israel out of Egypt, he didn't take them directly into their inheritance. He said, lest their hearts fail them when they see war. Meaning we've been, wow. we've become, in a sense, they were slaves, but they, they had a routine that was, con- they didn't even realize how, how little they were operating with in terms of God's inheritance, but they were happy there. And I think we're happy to settle for less so long as we have personal peace and prosperity. Francis Schaeffer, the great theologian, wrote years ago, he predicted the end time church would have this problem, that we would give up our freedom in exchange for the promise of personal peace in our time and don't interrupt my finances. And we would surrender our courage and our rights. And I think we've done that. I think for the sake of personal peace and prosperity, we've allowed the enemy to gobble up our liberties. Now, here's the problem. with Temporary. 
yeah, with the, with the palace scenario, is that I was looking at something like just this morning. Uh, Tucker has a very interesting uh, nine-minute segment. I just posted it on Twitter if somebody wants to grab it, or probably by the time this broadcast is out, you just have to hunt it down. But it was just within the last 24 hours, he talks about, as, an, as, a, as a guy who considers himself a Christian, he says he loves the Apostle Paul. He said, here's a guy who was the worst of the worst who became the best of the best, which gives you hope that anyone can change. He said, but the characteristic of Paul was he burned up every day of his life knowing he had a sentence of death on his head, so he wanted to get all the distance out of everything he did because he was courageous about death, saying, basically, if I die, to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. He said, if you're a Christian and you're afraid to die, what does it tell you about the reality of your Christianity? Come on. I mean, he threw it right out there. And he said he okay. quit the Episcopal Church when during COVID, his, a woman who was the minister said she wasn't going to have services for fear that she could contract the disease and die. He said, well, you evidently don't even believe in your own Christian inheritance because you're worried about what happens next. So that's, yeah. what, that's what caused the disengage. That's Tucker. Everybody loves Tucker. That's his spiritual journey out of the organized church. He says, I love the church, but I had to exit because their fear in dealing with things is incongruent with what they say they believe. Wow. Think about that. Wow, that is so powerful. Okay, well, I think... <laughs> <laughs> so good. I think we need lands to pray the spirit of intimidation off of this country. <laughs> no, but we do. It, mm -hmm. we're, we're at the closing point, and I just... That is so profound, and thank you, Lance, so much, because your perspective is unique. You bring something. It's like we talk about in our culture, the beach ball, mm -hmm. and we hold up a beach ball, and we say, what color do you see, Lance? And you're like, red. And I say, well, I see blue. And we're yeah. both right. Some <laughs> right. things are absolute truth. Some things are right and wrong. But this is like our views, our opinions. And you bring a side of the beach ball that not a lot of people are bringing to the table. And so thank you so much for what you're bringing. Thank you for what you brought. But would you just pray whatever is in you um, over sure. our audience? We just we always want to close with prayer because that's what we're about. But prayer, it, it changes things. And so would you do that uh, for us? Absolutely. And I, I, I want to share something because I I remember there was a writer on time management years ago who gave a great illustration. He said, um, he said, you don't have to be courageous to do something courageous. He mm -hmm. said, it, it all has to do with what your attention is on. He said, for instance, he said, uh, if I took an average housewife here and said, I've got a, a, you know, a one foot wide board between one building and another, and I'd like you to walk out 10 feet onto the board and come back again, uh, you'd look down those 30 stories and go, or 20 stories and go, no way, why would I do that? Now let your three-year-old toddler get away from you while you're on a tour, and then to your horror, you see they've gone four or five feet out onto a board you suddenly will go out on that board, pick up your baby, and come back like an acrobat to the best of your ability because what you see at risk is more important than your own life, and you're not on, thinking yeah. about yourself at the moment. Your maternal instinct That's takes it. over. Come on. That's the mama bear movement. Father, we pray the maternal instinct of the American female will become so activated like a she-bear coming out that it will deal with the lawlessness. It will literally push back on the darkness. It will resist the devil in such a way that the devil will flee from this movement. I pray that you raise up Hispanic, African-American, Asian, uh, all nationalities of females to stand together, releasing such confusion on the ranks of the manipulated media that they won't know how to characterize it. I pray for more evidence of the tragedy of what is happening with our children right now so that it becomes irrefutable front page testimony and that within the next 10 months, the mothers of America are going to rise up and in a Malachi moment, they're going to literally be uh, pushing back against the enemy to put their arms around their family and that you will use this for a family revival in the United States of America. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray, grant us boldness, and show us what to pay attention to so that our fears dissolve in Jesus' name. 
In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Lance, thank you so much for being with us. I hope we can get you back really soon. Um, thanks for all you are doing for such a time as this. You're, you are a Mordecai, and we need you, so thank you. Appreciate God bless you so you. much. God bless you. Did you enjoy this latest episode? Please remember to share it with your friends, because the more knowledge you have, the better equipped you are to navigate the world.